Thank you very much. Um, sorry we have no ALS interpreters today. We just got a call just now uh, that they couldn't make it, so we will be broadcasting the press conference a little later. Um, and today uh, I want to going to provide an update on COVID update along with testing and vaccine resources that we have. Uh, also, I'm going to talk, talk about Boston's approach to the new steps in the state's reopening plan as well as school reopening and outdoor dining here in Boston. Uh, Chief Martinez will also provide uh, more public health information and take any questions regarding uh, public health questions. Um, the state numbers reported as of yesterday, Sunday, 1,428 new confirmed cases of COVID-19, 52 confirmed COVID deaths in the Commonwealth, bringing the death total in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, since the beginning of the pandemic to 15,796. Uh, in Boston, we do have today's numbers in Boston. Uh, today's numbers are 119 new cases. Uh, the total since the beginning of the pandemic in Boston of, of cases, 58,901. We have two new deaths that were reported, bringing our death total to 1,273. Uh, our thoughts and prayers are with, uh, with the families who have lost their loved ones during this horrible time, and also for the folks that are still sick and suffering in hospital or at home. We want you to know we're thinking of you and praying for you. The latest complete data that we have for the week ending February 21st, an average of nearly 3,800 Boston residents were tested for COVID each day. That does not include uh, college testing. The seven-day average for the daily positive, te daily positive tests were 161. The average daily positive test rate was 3.5%. Our case metrics leveled off and even ticked upward a little bit in the last few days of data. Uh, we're not really seeing a big trend here, but we did see the numbers go up a bit from the previous, I believe, last three, three and a half weeks. It's not a cause for concern, but it's a good reminder not to take uh, the positive trend that we've been seeing for granted. Uh, we still have, and we all have, lots of work to do. We must continue to do everything we can to protect ourselves and the community against the virus. I'm asking again, people, please wear masks. Um, with, that makes kind of snug to your face a good fit. Uh, whether you wear one or two masks, make sure that they are a tight fit on the sides of your face. So now we're taking this a little further. When it comes to the masks, I think it's really important as we try to battle this virus back. We're asking continue to wash your hands frequently, frequently with soap and warm water as often as possible. Or anytime you touch a surface, if you can remember, just go wash your hands. That'd be important. If you don't have hot water available, use hand sanitizer until you can. We're asking you people to continue to social distance and avoid large gatherings, and we want to continue to push people and ask people to get tested frequently. Uh, we also have we have 25 test sites throughout the city of Boston. We, we as, as I've been saying now for quite a bit, we've been continuing to support our mobile testing sites that are free and open to all, regardless of symptom. Uh, I can announce today that our mobile testing sites will continue operation through at least the month of March. Uh, right, just as a reminder, our mobile testing sites are in Jamaica Plain at the Anna Cole Community Center in the Mildred Haley Apartments, in High Park at the Boston Renaissance Charter School parking lot, in Dorchester at the Strand Theater and Prince Hall Grand Lodge. For more information about accessing these sites and others uh, testing locations in the city, you can visit boston.gov or call 311. We continue to work with the state on the vaccine rollout. Right now, adults 65 years old and older and adults with two underlying health conditions are eligible to get vaccinated, as well as everyone eligible in phase one. In Boston, we currently have 17 vaccination sites that are open to all eligible residents. Those include seven community-based centers in High Park, East Boston, the South End, Dorchester, Mattapan, Rosendale, and South Boston. Eight pharmacies in the neighborhoods including East Boston, Roxbury, and Mattapan in Dorchester, and two mass vaccination sites, one at the Reggie Lewis Center and the other at Fenway Park. We are proud of the equitable access we've been able to provide to city residents, especially at the Reggie Lewis Center. Over the weekend, we held the Black History Month event on site to promote vaccine access and health equity. It was sponsored by our community organizations like the Black Boston COVID Coalition. I also want to thank our City of Boston Black Employee Network for distributing COVID care kits there on the weekend. This weekend alone, 1,600 people were vaccinated at the Reggie Lewis. Moving forward, we're going to continue to hold 50% of the slots eligible for people of color working through community health centers and city agencies. 
We're also going to continue to provide access for vulnerable residents who may face any barriers. In Boston, over 100 senior affordable housing buildings will be vaccinating residents, staff on site, and some have already begun. We talked about it today in our morning call uh, to make sure that we get uh, good setups in those places to get people vaccinated. Uh, it particularly includes the Boston Housing Authority, which is hosting clinics for residents of public housing who are elderly and disabled. So we'll get the system set up and we'll just continue to be able to vaccinate everyone as we move forward. Over the weekend, the Boston Housing Authority clinics were held up at the, held at the Estonia Apartments in the North End, St. Patolf Apartments in the Back Bay South End, and the Monsignor Powers Apartment in South Boston. This Friday, we're launching a mobile vaccination pilot clinic at the Martin Luther King Towers in Roxbury, and more clinics will be offered at additional developments next week. So we're going to continue to, to move, move our vaccine program uh, as quickly as possible so that we can get more and more, as we get more and more vaccinations here in the state, in the city. We want to get them out to people as soon as possible. I want to give a special shout out and thank the Boston Housing Authority and the teams, Kate Bennett and her team at the Boston Housing Authority, the Boston Public Health Commission, Rita Nuevas and her team along with Marty. Uh, Boston EMS, uh, Chief Hooley and his team at Boston EMS, who have been doing an amazing job. Uh, Emily Shea and all the staff of the Eight Strong Commission and all of our partners that we have in the city. Uh, this is certainly a team effort and we're doing as much as we can, as quickly as we can to get the vaccines out and into people uh, so that we can uh, get more and more people vaccinated. Uh, to seniors and anyone who is eligible, I encourage you to take the opportunity to protect yourself. Uh, Boston residents 65 years old and older can call 311 to get connected to the city's Age Strong Commission, to help, and we have help in multiple languages. So if you live in the city of Boston and you want to get vaccinated and you're 65 and older and, and you're having a hard time accessing the computer, we want you to call 311. Anyone who's watching this that does not live in the city of Boston, if you're having a hard time and you want to get connected, you call 211 to get connected to the state. And there are call takers that are there to help you and want to help you with this. If there's a bit of a wait, it's worth the wait just to wait to get those calls. We want to make sure that we're, um, we're helping, as much, helping as much as possible. Veterans 55 or older enrolled in the VA healthcare can get vaccinated at any VA health facility in Boston. Uh, for a full schedule of vac vaccine, vaccine eligibility, we're asking you to go to mass.gov slash COVID vaccine. That's mass.gov slash COVID vaccine. The state also, as I mentioned, has a vaccine schedule resource available at 211. So if, you, if you're not calling from the city of Boston or even the city, you can call 211, but our call takers here will help you and help uh, ease the burden a bit from the state. For more information about sites in Boston, Go to boston.gov slash COVID-19 vaccine. The governor announced last week that the state is moving forward in reopening, starting today with phase three, step two, and starting on March 22nd with phase four, step one. I want to be clear, we're also moving forward here in the city of Boston along with the state. But we have some important exceptions to change the changes that are going into effect today. This will consist of our cautious approach. We follow carefully the local case data and public health guidance, and we take an approach that fits our unique qualities as a large, mostly dense city. So today, March 1st, we are moving forward with up to 50% maximum capacity at many of our indoor businesses, including gyms, museums, offices, movie theaters, hotels, and stores. We are moving forward to allow the use of fitting rooms in retail stores. And we are lifting the capacity limit at restaurants while requiring six feet of space between tables, six maximum per table, and a 90 minute limit on seating. So we're still asking restaurants to make sure there's space inside the restaurant. And we have not increased the six people at a table at this point. And I know restaurants want that, but just be patient with us. We will get there. We want to make sure that the numbers are safe before we do that. What we're not moving forward with is live music in restaurants until at least March 22nd. We are not opening indoor performance venues like concert halls and theaters until at least March 22nd. And we are not opening higher con contact indoor recreation like roller skating, laser tag, um, until at least March 22nd. On those steps, as well as phase four, we will be moving forward on March 22nd if our cases and data of public health guidance supports that. 
I just want everyone to understand that we are committed to the, an economic recovery that's strong for Boston. And at the same time, keeping people safe and continuing to slow the, the virus must be our top and first priority. As always, economic recovery depends on your public health progress. That's how we'll move forward. Small businesses can learn more on our weekly small business conference call tomorrow, Tuesday at 3 p.m. You can register at boston.gov slash smallbusinesses. And our Reopen Boston Fund is still taking applications from businesses with 25 employees or fewer. I have a, a message also on the St. Patrick's Day, Evacuation Day, Weekend Day celebrations that we have here in the Boston. Um, unfortunately, the parade's canceled again this year, and I want to thank the parade organizers who have uh, made some really tough decisions to, to make sure we keep people safe. Uh, I'm grateful to everyone who's been involved in cooperating. I also want to be clear that there should be no large gatherings of any kind for St. Patrick's Day. We are so close to a finish line here that what we don't need now is a step backwards. We're opening up. The governor's opening up. We're trying to open up more businesses. We're trying to get fans in the stands at Fenway and at the Garden. We're trying to do that. But events like St. Patrick's Day and weekends like St. Patrick's Day can throw us back. They can become super spreader events, and we could be in a situation where we're shutting everything down again. Private gatherings remain limited to 10 people indoors and 25 pe people outdoors. There will be no exceptions to the rule on restaurants, bars, or private gatherings. Last week, we held a meeting with businesses that, traditionally busy on, that are traditionally busy on St. Patrick's Day. We want to be clear that spacing requirements and time limits are still in place for the St. Patrick's Day weekend. There should be no alcohol without food service in the St. Patrick's Day weekend. And we won't allow lines outside restaurants. Enforcement will continue to be in place, and I appreciate everyone's cooperation. If you remember back to this time last year, it was at the beginning of the pandemic, and we had lines on a Friday night, St. Patrick's Day weekend. We had lines up and down different streets in South Boston, other parts of the neighborhood. And the restaurants took it upon themselves to shut down on St. Patrick's Day. They lost business that day. What we don't want to see is restaurants lose business this year. So please be cognizant of the people around you and to make sure that we stay safe. Hopefully a year from now, St. Patrick's Day, uh, there will be no, no uh, real rules or regulations in place and we'll be able to have the fun and, and the celebration that we all want to have. Also, we're incredibly grateful for our restaurants. We know uh, what a struggle has been for them in this past year. It's probably uh, many people have put their life savings into opening restaurants, uh, and they're on the verge of losing their life, not just their restaurant, but their life savings. But we do have some good news as spring approaches. Outdoor dining was one of the biggest spots, uh, one of the biggest spots of this, brightest spots of this experience uh, last summer and fall here in the city of Boston. We work together to create safe and accessible conditions on both public health and private spaces. And the program brought much needed viability back into our streets and our small businesses. Outdoor dining on public property ended in December because of the winter. But we are bringing it back for 2021 starting on April 1st or as soon as the weather permits it to be happen. We are once again waiving fees to remove that barrier to apply for this program. We have a centralized online application so both business and residents can follow the process, and we have technical support available for all restaurants. We are doing targeted outreach for underrepresented businesses and communities, and will once again be restricting parking and closing certain streets to open up spaces for dining, outdoor dining. We'll have more details on specific streets in the coming weeks. The Disabilities Commission has been very active and plays an important role in reviewing the process and it's, a, it's about making sure people have access to these restaurants. All of us have access to these restaurants. The program was made stronger by community input, so we welcome community conversation. The online application has been live since December 10th, and we've already received over 370 applications, with more than 150 already approved here in the city. Applications moving forward will be reviewed by a rolling basis. You can learn more or submit an application to boston.gov slash 2021 outdoor dining. Today also is another, another positive bright light in the city of Boston. The Boston Public Schools welcomed all students in pre-kindergarten through third grade back in person learning in the classroom if their families decided to opt in. They joined the high priority students who have been in school since the fall. We'll continue to bring students back safely into our schools as long as the public health data supports it. 
Grades four to eight will be eligible for in-person learning starting on March 15th, and all remaining students will be eligible on March 29th. This morning I was at the Martin Luther King K-8 school in Dorchester to welcome young students back into the building. It was uh, exciting to see that, and it was, uh, it was great to see the little faces smiling and happy. Uh, they were full of, full of energy, and they just wanted to talk. And I had a chance to walk around, and I thank the teachers, I thank the staff, I thank the principal, I thank the custodians, I thank the food service workers, I thank all the people that have been working entirely throughout this pandemic, uh, not complaining about it, just, just doing their job. So I want to thank them for their work. I also want to thank the parents and guardians and teachers uh, for, for all, of, all of the work that you've done over this last year. I know it's been challenging. It's been challenging to quite honestly everyone. So I just want to say it was great to see uh, the kids come back and I want to give a special shout out to our bus drivers and transportation staff for their strong performance today. Um, most of the buses were on time. I know that it's going to be a little tricky as we get moving forward here uh, because we haven't run the citywide buses in a while. So I just want to thank the bus drivers as well for all of your great work. I want to thank everyone who worked to prepare our classrooms to the highest safety and standard anywhere in the country, so thank you for that. In addition to all the work on spacing and air quality, we are moving forward with our pooled COVID testing for students whose families consent. It's a good system for prevent preventing the spread of the virus, and as we move forward, we're going to take every opportunity we can to keep our school community safe and open. It's really important that we keep schools open for our young people as we continue to move forward here. Uh, finally, today is the beginning of Women's History Month. In Boston, we certainly believe in empowering women and protecting all of their rights. That's been a hallmark of my administration and something that we're really proud of here. This month is an opportunity to celebrate everything that women do for our city, especially during this last difficult year. Women in city government and throughout our communities have led in many of the most important responses here in Boston from health care to food access to housing support to education. I want to take a moment to thank them. Women have taken on a huge burden in the home, reminding us that we have lots of work to do to achieve a fair economy. We have a range of events planned for Women's History Month through our Office of Women's Advancement, and our Executive Director, Alex Valdez, is, is leading, leading the way in the city. We can learn more by going to boston.gov slash women uh, to find more about Women's History Month. And with that, I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Marty Martinez to talk a little more about COVID. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple quick uh, additional updates that I would share. Um, starting today, we will start to release uh, Boston-specific data regarding who is being vaccinated in the city. Uh, we'll start to release that online to provide a snapshot of information. As you all know, uh, Mayor Walsh and the team, we have continued to lean into data to help us understand gaps, understand progress, and understand how to make decisions. Um, and that, that is no different. Um, as of February the 23rd, which is the last complete data we have from the state, uh, over 96,000 Bostonians have gotten their first COVID shot, um, which is about 16.5% of the population over the age of 16 um, who's eligible. Um, so to see 96,000 folks having gotten their first shot is great. Um, that's over a week ago, so likely uh, many more included in there. Uh, and about of those folks, about 42% of shots have gone into the arms of people of color here in the city of Boston, which continues to be an important piece of our work to make sure that we create equitable access to the vaccine in communities of color. Uh, we will release and share more information. Our goal is to release it weekly um, and to examine that data. Uh, that data will include neighborhood-based data and age-based data as well, which will help us understand where we're making progress and where we need uh, to do more. Um, again, the mobile effort that Mayor Walsh mentioned, we're going to continue to bring vaccines to people, um, not only have these locations uh, across the city, which are important, but ensure that we're bringing vaccines to locations. So we were able to do that this weekend in partnership with BHA and the Independent uh, Mass Association of Pharmacies, but EMS will do that this Friday as well um, uh, to pilot that effort. So this is the beginning of an effort that we want to continue across our approaches to ensure that we can bring vaccines to people, whether it's to buildings and facilities, when the weather changes potentially, to more public locations to make it accessible. Uh, but our goal will be to use our four approaches 
that we've laid out. Mass vaccination sites, priority group clinics, community-based clinics open to anyone eligible, and then our mobile effort, which will be, again, bringing uh, vaccinations to people as they become um, eligible. Um, so again, we were gonna continue our work across and make sure that we can uh, get folks vaccinated. Um, we were excited to hear J&J uh, &J get approval, emergency use approval, which will help bring more vaccine into Massachusetts, into Boston, and create more access across our community. So we're eager to see that roll out over the next couple of weeks. So with that, I'll open it up to any COVID-specific questions uh, that people may have. Yeah, so the questions about social distancing in our schools um, uh, and having the ability to maintain that six feet of distance. Um, Boston Public Schools worked with Boston Public Health Commission um, to sort of look school by school to be able to figure out the, the, make, uh, the best way to ensure that the number of students that were being invited in could be spaced out by desks and space. Um, and it's, uh, it, it takes some real work, right? I mean, some of our buildings are smaller, some of them are larger, uh, but again, the, we have the capacity based based on sort of the formula um, that we've worked through with BPS to ensure that students can socially distant. Um, it's not just about the physical space, but it's also about doing everything we can for young ones to stay uh, separated, which is part of the challenge. Uh, but what I would say is that BPS and BPHC have worked hard to ensure that that space can exist and that there's room for folks to do that by spacing out desks, by having barriers uh, for teachers in terms of locations where they are close to students uh, to to make sure that that exists. So I believe we still have more room for more students based on the numbers and the space. Um, so right now we'll continue to partner with BPS and the commission to ensure that that uh, can exist safely. But we are excited that students are back in, in classes in large numbers today. Other questions? Yep. The question is, when do we expect Johnson & Johnson to arrive and, and, and what quantity? Obviously, all of that is in partnership with the state, and the state sort of leads that effort. Um, the state's communicated. They think it'll be within the next two weeks or so. You'll start to see Johnson & Johnson come into, Bo into Massachusetts and into Boston. Uh, we also believe our pharmacies will be one of the first locations where we'll start to see uh, Johnson & Johnson. I think it's super important for, for Bostonians to remember. It's one shot, which is great. creates a lot of access. It's been a proven 100% effective in preventing um, uh, death and serious hospitalization. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. So to add another vaccine to the other two vaccines already approved are going to help us continue to slow the spread. Uh, so we're really eager about that and eager to see it included. With that, uh, thank you so much. Yeah, we have no, no additional information right now. Thank you.